uh, as much as the value that they contributed in the production process. So this first contradiction is a contradiction between the capitalists and the leaders in the production process itself in the very long run. And this will lead to many crises. crises. Um, you don't see this kind of crisis anymore. I mean, it still happened, but not on a large scale. But this kind of crisis actually happened in the 1920s after the World War. That's just this before the financial systems are getting more complicated. Uh, but before that, this you can actually see this quite often. That's why you have a Keynes uh, uh, formulation because you, you have to stimulate more demand and all those things. But now that's why some Marxists uh, actually abandoned this particular theory because this contract it's still contract. Uh, it's, there's always a conflict with capitalism and labor, but the crisis that took form doesn't directly involve its labors and capitalists. Like what happened in the uh, house crisis, for instance, is quite quite something else. Like, I'll explain to you later. It's a kind of a contradiction of a different form. Because this is basically, I mean, okay, I'm gonna, one of the assignments that I hope we can do is that I'm gonna give you two set of essays. Uh, I'm, uh, again, I'm not sure how to divide it, but again, I will give you into a few groups. Now. No, I'm gonna ask for volunteers. How many of us would like to look at the essays? So they're gonna be, somebody's gonna look at the essays that suggest this particular uh, argument still works in this modern economy. Uh, that you will have to read Andrew Clement or Michael Roberts. The other one uh, will include uh, who, did, who disagree with this. We'll have to look at David, Har David Harvey. And the good thing about them is that we are literally directly interacting with, with each other. We are basically replying articles. So you can actually see the, the, the kind of a direct communication between them in a way. And that's where, at least if you're, if you're the team A, the team Freedom of Profits, Pauline, kind of a team, uh, that particular team, then you somehow look at the argument for the essay, and you later, when we, when we have the next classes, you will have to present one of the arguments, what, and uh, have to present, present a case why that particular arguments are still strong and relevant, and you are, if you are David Harvey, you have to be brought back, and then obviously, then the rest, the audiences will have to decide, and have to actually somehow, uh, okay, we're gonna have a vote, uh, because my practice is, when I was in Manchester, this is what my lecture did. Uh, they, they, they have a mock, not mock, it's a, it's a, it's a theoretical debate. Uh, because there's two lectures in a come. It's not, it's not student, two lectures. They're going to come and pick a different position. They plan it already. They uh, it's not like there's a proper debate where you know, they have a different position and they argue against each other. But they pick a two different position and try, try to present the arguments in contrast to each other and see how they interact with each other in a way. That was what I was hoping to do. Uh, in a very limited sense, of course, because again, uh, this might be slightly more complicated here and there, but if you look at the essays alone, the one that I'm gonna give you later, there's always, there's enough uh, information there, there's enough argument, it's quite easy to understand as well, and there's a graph and everything, so you can actually go there and try to contrast between those who support it and those who against it. So we're gonna skip this one. This is what the next. I'm gonna explain a bit on the on next section. I'm gonna skip this. Now this is the critics on Marx. Uh, you should read the critics on Marx. Then you be motivated to read this. Okay. Uh, okay. This is basically the, the one I'm gonna talk about a bit more. The one that I provided uh, for today. What is the time now? Marx. Is it Marx? So okay, in the book, I highly recommend you to read the book. This is one of the most awesome books that I've read about capitalism. Uh, because first, uh, not, I mean, it's really easy to understand, and I think at this rate, if you guys have attended the classes so far, it's easy for you to pick up the books, because the language that he used, the word use value, exchange value, the value, the labor, blah, 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 um, it's all there, and it makes sense to you very quickly. So in that particular book, he tried to outline 70 contradictions. This is the book written by David Harvey, called The Seven Conditions uh, at the End of Capitalism. There's no the, the title of that, but there's a 70 contradiction, and this is basically the contradictions. The first one is the contradiction between use value, exchange value, and all those things. Uh, but the whole 17 contradictions, uh, he divided into three categories. Uh, the plan is, I mean, when I was writing the lecture like, slide this morning, again, I have a lot of other works to do, but I'm trying to like, steal some of my time to add some extra slides. Uh, we plan to cover at least uh, three or four of this. We skip the whole part. We just look at the dangerous predictions. 
because again, these are the more imminent ones. But I'll be able to actually uh, provide the slides for, I think, the second one, and roughly a bit of the third one. But I think it's going to take uh, longer enough, uh, and, uh, uh, in a way. So this is basically the contradiction. The first one is the foundation contradiction. This is, this is the contradiction at the very conceptual level. It's a very abstract kind of a, uh, kind of a contradiction, but it has a political objective implications. Because again, remember we have a use value exchange value. According to Marx, I mean, according to Harvey's reading of Marx, that these are always constant contradictions. But what does it mean by contradictions? First, it's not an Aristotelian contradiction. Aristotle said that if it's contra contra contradictory, it means it's not true. If, um, for example, it's two statements, statements A, statements B, and statement A and B are contradictory, so it's either one to, can, can, can be true, couldn't be both, right? Uh, if they are, say, I'll give you an example, like, for example, like, Imran is basically 24 years old, the second statement is Imran is 25 years old. Uh, both statements are talking about Imran, the same subject, but both can be, cannot be true. So there's a kind of contradiction of statements there. So he was not talking about that kind of contradiction, he was talking about a dialectical process. What he meant by that is this, that in the particular system itself, despite the, the unity, the kind of uh, interaction between these particular components and that particular components, you are always in have a different conflicts. And the particular conflicts, there's a different force colliding against each other. In a way. If you are going for use value, you have to abandon exchange value, and all those things, and that lead to many kind and many form of crisis. Okay, we're gonna first look at the second one. Yeah, this is, we won't be able to look at the second contradiction, blah, blah, blah. But one thing to know that all the contradictions are not mutually exclusive, but all connected and supporting each other to form a bigger totality. So, these contradictions somehow only be able to, to become a contradictions when they, they are also other contradictions. So, the first one can only make sense if you understand the second one and the third one as well, because they are all interrelated. In what side there are contradictions, in non in sense, it's a dialectic process, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay, look at the first, these are the slides that I cannot be able to make it. I just put it there, one. Uh, <laughs> but again, we can explain it in a very simple form. That every day, we have a, I mean, every good service, the rules that we would like to sell, there's always this value, use value and exchange value. Uh, the problem lies when um, certain things are being used more of exchange value, rather than use value. And he gave an example of a house. What happens in the, the housing crisis in 2007 or 8 is basically that. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. You, you somehow dominate exchange value more than the use value. But again, this is not a, it's not picking sides. Uh, but again, if you pick use value alone, uh, how do you decide between the two? You know? He was trying to show that there's no kind of an easy way out. What he just tried to flash out is that there's always these contradictions. And by taking this one particular side, we somehow have a tendency to produce this kind of crisis. But say if everyone doesn't actually sell the house, then you have to build a house on your own. Isn't it? If there's no one selling a house, then you have to create your house alone. So again, can you manage to do it at this particular age? Maybe you, you have to go to work. Uh, you have to support yourself in many ways. And what, 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 when are you going to have your time to actually create your own house? So there's always this constant contradiction. Contradictions. Um, uh, that's uh, if you look uh, later the, in the readings as well. I'll give you the chapter. I have the body of copy. Okay, this is the most important one. Sir. The second contradiction is the contradiction between money and value. Okay, what is money in the end? Um, in any kind of a free market system, especially in this sky. You can't have a commodity interaction uh, exchange without money. Uh, of course, back in those days, we can have a barter system. It's an individual kind of interaction, but one of the economies are getting more complicated. You have to introduce money as part of a means of uh, means of exchange, if you like. But again, what is really is the money. So money, in a very general sense, serves a couple of purposes. These are the purpose, these are the purposes that we've learned in, in the basic economic textbook. The first one is as a mean as a medium of circulation, is to try to facilitate exchanges between two different goods. 
it's also somehow provide a single measuring rod. It's constrained in a way. Uh, because again, if you have, I mean, uh, the, you need to have a standard standard um, currency for you to be able to exchange in an equal manner, isn't it? And also it provides a way to store value. So these are, I think mean, there's, the, there's a fourth one. There's always, a, I mean, I remember when I was doing L level, there's the four values, four functions. Uh, but these are the main three that I know. But the fourth one, I can't remember. But it's not relevant on this discussion. So. Sorry? Oh, you're going to treat yeah. My A-levels teachers are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> she confused me in a way. Yeah. Do you remember Tiana? There's four. There's, I was looking at the slides later. Like, we had the fourth one. What the fourth one? What the fourth one? I couldn't find it. But this, this is the basic tree in a real life. But again, what does the money represent? How does it profit it itself in social and political functions? Uh, again, what is really is the money? This is a very mysterious thing, you know. Because money, um, to me, it's kind of a paradox of money. Because okay, what's in a very general sense, money is trying to represent or make a claim on the social labels of others. What does it mean? If you have a certain amount of money, you can use that money to somehow get the other commodities they are being produced by other labels, right? So the money is a means for you to claim uh, others, uh, other people's product or hard works. That's the basic general sense of the money. So the claim is, is on the label, which is expanded on the production process in the market cases. So because all of us, again, we need the money. We need money because, again, we need to exchange other, our goods with others because we cannot produce anything. At the end of the day, we need to exchange with others because we can't produce foods on our own or house on our own. So we have to specialize in a way that somebody else produces food, somebody else produces something else, and we exchange. So it's a kind of an impose upon us. But again, if this kind of exchange took place, what money really represents? What he, what the money represents is the social value. What value again is the amount of labor? You remember the last two, the last lecture that the val value is actually the amount of labor. The value of goods is actually not the, the not the moral values of all those things, like, but the social value, the values of the good itself, is actually the amount of labor spent in the production process. Is the activity of the of the laboring process that underpins the, what is that money, what the money represents. So money is trying to represent that, that labor, uh, that, uh, that labor that is involved in the production process. So if the, the price of the, 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 the pens are 2 ringgit, that 2 ringgit is actually trying to represent the value of the workers or the labor's input in producing that, that particular stuff. Okay, and like any other goods, like any other, uh, like any other Economic systems, when you talk about labor's value, labor as a value, you can't really see those things. That's why you need money to represent. Here again, these particular choices are being imposed on you. You can't avoid it to have money. Because once you engage in this particular kind of transactions, you can't really have, um, it's because your value, the labor that was involved in the project, the value of your labors cannot represent itself because it's very immaterial. How many sweat, you're not, you're not going to count how many sweat you work. You can say how many hours you work, yes, but it, again, how do you put the value to, to that number of hours? You still somehow caught with that particular system where those up number of hours of works have value, but those values have, have to be represented in form money. Money somehow represents those things. So it requires a material representation, which is basically the money itself. But here comes the problem. Um, the first problem that I, uh, that Ma, uh, the, uh, David Tavi recognized is that when you represent something, uh, when the, some things are being represented by some other things, there's a gap. It's no longer kind of a direct, uh, direct. I think with, I don't want to say performances. Just, just example this way. Like, I mean, did you know Telemuro? You know Telemuro? It's a game, right? So um, it's, it's one people start off with something, then he asks people to represent it to other people. The other reason for other people, though it is loss of uh, loss of meanings, <laughs> in this particular case, there's no meanings involved, la, but the value, how, the, because of the interaction between market, uh, uh, the, the interaction in the market between demand and supply, and all those things, to determine the price, the price will actually somehow reflect the values. But because of this mechanism, it's kind of trying to represent. There's not these indirect representations. 
there's always this constant kind of a disturbance for them for the price to somehow reflect the real value of the good itself. That's the first kind of basic problem at the, uh, in, a, in a very general sense, but it's become more complicated when we have a complex form of money later. The second thing that I didn't put here is that, uh, the one that you saw yesterday, last session as well, is about commodity fetishism. Once you have money to represent your value, and that money somehow is being expressed in the form of price attached to the goods being sold in the market, it somehow it hides the, 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 the worker's relation behind the production process. That's a commodity fetishism in a very general sense. That those workers that are involved with the production process, that produce their particular goods, that somehow have a certain values, that contribute to certain values to that particular good production process, those values, you can't see them in the market because what only, you only see the prices itself. Uh, partly, uh, one of the problems of this is that you can't see the, the exploitation going on behind the prices that you see. So that's, again, this is a bigger debate and we can actually look at the, the discussion later. But these are the themes that I think you would like to explore during the discussion weeks, uh, the next two classes. So, Okay, this relation can also be misleading because the gap between social values and its representation is usually with potential contradiction depending on the form of the money it takes. Now, now money is asking, look at the history of money. This started off with gold and probably silver. In a way. Because why is gold and silver are the most, one, maybe not to say the most against arguable, but see it's one of the most stable um, goods and uh, goods that can be used to somehow act as a money, as a measure of standards. And one can argue that uh, most of the goods are now already being uh, being extracted from the earth. So there's no, it's a, it's a very inelastic, if you like. There's no suddenly, there's no discovery of gold in the planet moon or whatever. Uh, but most of the goods in the, on, on earth are already being discovered, one thing. The second thing, it's also hard to find. It's not that something that you can find on, backyard, on your backyard. Mm. So these kind of a, Characteristics somehow makes the makes gold as one of the quite a interesting and a useful means of representation for the for for for, for the for the value of the goods itself because that particular gold itself is quite stable the value of the gold itself is stable but again there's a different set of problems that comes into being what is it because it's a you can't bring golds anywhere you know how happy the gold is right. And of course, the gold have a certain values, yes, but in a minor economic transaction, you want to buy groceries, which actually cost like you know, two pence or two ringgit. How, how do you, uh, golds are maybe cost even bigger than that. So how do you use that to, to, to somehow conduct the small economic transactions? Then you come up with another system, which is coins. What is coins again? Coin is trying to represent the money. Now we have a double representation here. While the gold was supposed to represent the value, the money are trying to represent the gold. There's more wider, there's more gap now. Now the third form is that we have a e-money, which is the money, uh, the, the money account, which is even more weirder, and more peculiar form of representation because now it's not just, it's not just the coin, the physical coins. It's the numbers on the screen. Again, which can be manipulated in a, in a very strange way. For example, if you look at uh, during the Wall Street crisis, there's always a debate of quantitative easing. They put, a, I think, three trillion or whatever uh, in the in the economy to somehow make the economy works again. Because this three trillion doesn't just come from this one specific goal. It's only come out uh, being 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 found somewhere in Africa. This can be done because we are not entering the the, the, the age of e, e currency. Or e money. Those numbers can be created on a thin end. Really. That's why you can have a three trillion just print the papers, put it in. So this thing can 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 get away because this kind of a gap between the values that it's trying to represent and the form that it takes. That's the first kind of a kind of contradiction that's happening at the moment. So uh so it's widely gap allows more manipulations, for example the washing crisis and other QDs in the seventies. This is a, uh, uh, one of the during the current recession uh, as well that the government, that the government of America, I think this is where it, they introduce three trillions, they inject three trillions as a quantitative easings, 
because I'm hoping that only runs in memory. Um, so money of the cow, or the e-money, is actually reduced the actual amount of real money involved in the production process or in the market itself. Anyway. So this kind, of, this kind of money as well allows credit and takes its form into more another peculiar forms. In a way, it allows loan system uh, to take at the scale that's quite weird because again, what is loan in there? Loan is, is if me and you loaning, I loan the money to you, right? It's okay because again, you're gonna give it to me in the later future. Something is it's quite easy to understand between two people. But if you are loan, you're loaning a money that is not there. Basically, what banks does, you are loaning the money that is not there. Because why? The money presentation is now as mere numbers on the screen. You can just add the numbers there, and suddenly the money exists and created. And that loan uh, is somehow created out of thin air. So you, know, you, are, you loan the money from, from, from where? Some would argue you loan the money from the future. So I basically taking the money from the future now. The thing is, you can't control the future in the sense where somebody from the future is going to stop you. Unless we have a time machine in the way at one point, then maybe we can, but because of there's no kind of restrictions there, what happens is that there's no limit to loans. Really. And there's no limit to loans. You can just create and keep on giving loans. And the same thing is happening uh, when the quantitative easings are being introduced uh, during the crisis. Okay. Any crisis is okay, just choose more money. But the thing is, it's, it's a kind of a loan distribution. Where the future, the future people doesn't have right to say no. So this kind of, when you have into credit money, it distinct. When it takes this particular form, it's become more peculiar. And when you have a greater, greater, greater distance between the representations and the value itself, the whole economy is starting to get more, 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 more chaotic, more unpredictable, and not being being manipulated uh, by by certain certain classes and, uh, and individuals. So credit money in this in this comes with a huge complicated world that some theories you get as very different from other money. Uh, this is a loan, but the paradox of loan, where does the money come from? But most important of all, uh, money is a medium of representations. This kind of a contradiction between money and money to represent the value is this allow the very MCM that we see before. Because money, because money as a material, material, you have a material of material physical appearances. It can somehow be used for as a capital. That is to say, to produce more money in a way. Money which supposedly measures value, which is again this, that's the function of money at the first. That's the function why we introduce money in the first place. In a very logical way, I mean, historically speaking, it's not quite a way, but logically speaking, I mean, the money was supposed to somehow mediate us when we try to exchange value for uh, other goods. But now it's become a kind of a commodity uh, in a sense that it's trying to produce more and more and more money. So when you have, it's become uh, a commodity, they have two functions. The function is to create more, more money and more profits. And the exchange value is basically the interest paid money. So this is what makes money as a measure of uh, social pressure and so hard. If, because if you look at other standard of measures, kilograms, centimeters, you can't objectify them, they don't sell them. But when it comes to money, the odd part is that this particular set of these things called money, have a magical power to create and double itself if you have the right amount and, have, and you follow the right certain amount of relationships, certain kind of a lines of uh, uh, line of arguments or line of uh, certain path, you can actually get the monies and get more monies, money to to re, 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 replicate itself, yeah. reduplicate itself. So all of this happened because of the inherent contradiction between various functions of money to present the value. Because monies have this particular kind of function. Money is used for store values. Uh, but again, I mean, uh, this is the commodity money is uh, are good at storing values. Commodity money is the money. But this function item when it comes to selecting commodities in the markets. Coins and papers are great as a means of medium of payment because it's easy for you to have the coin exchange, blah, blah, blah. But unless secure as a long-term store of value. So these things have their own expectation. These particular three sets of functional money have their own expectations and opens up a different set of possibilities. And often the possibilities of these three particular functions are contradicting against each other. Or in a way, it undermines other functions. Uh, 
So these different functions are not entirely consistent with each other, but nor are they independent. But again, for them to become human, they have to somehow come in a form where three are basically in the same, uh, the same concept. So money somehow must encompasses these three particular characteristics, but at the same time, money also must have these three characteristics fighting against each other. In a way. So there's kind of a contradiction, it's kind of a dialectical movement where it's required three, but not three. It's required three, but the other one's going to kill the other two. And MCM comes, okay, this is a teaser bar, it's a, uh, okay, this is a teaser, oxidized money. Have you heard of oxidized money? Okay, I was, okay, this is a, okay, I'm just going to be very quick about this before we move on to the videos later. But this is one of the, one of the solutions introduced by uh, Silvio Gassel, one of the classical economists, in fact. it's not actually even contemporary. Uh, he suggests that maybe money should be, should have, uh, should be, uh, one of the, the additional characteristic of money is that it can oxidize. What is in mind that is that to have an expired value, expired value. What is, what is, how does it solve the problem? Okay, first, it's somehow uh, able to restrain for those who are trying to save their money, try to give more and more and more money, to keep it to their banks and somehow keep it to themselves, so they become rich. So because at the end of the day, MCM is what? It's trying to create more and more money to store for yourself. <coughs> So if you store money for yourself, uh, say that like you, if you, you are basically classical and traditionalist, you are keeping more and more money, but then you keep it in your book, in your house, those money or in the bank, whatever it is. He said that the government or the society can be able to somehow enact a law that uh, if the monies are being stored as, as millions, billions, and not being used, um, it can expire. Think about that for a moment. I mean, how does it gonna change the whole, uh, the whole, uh, how the economies work as a whole. They would have found a new commodity to store value. Okay, it's true. Uh, but there's a counterback to that. Uh, but okay, it's, uh, people can, okay, people, okay, there's a few ways to escape this. One way is that, okay, if you want money, if storing money is, is a crime, I'm gonna buy a product, like a house, as a, as a kind of a storing the value for, for the money. But again, if you remember the last time, there's another condition that he had that, Every properties must be appropriated. <laughs> Let's say if you store, if you buy 10 houses but never use it, uh, it's again why the second principle that was being introduced. It's also somehow act as a defending mechanism to push the MCM attitudes. I use the word MCM to refer this this accumulation of wealth uh, for, for, for nothing, for more money. So this oxidized money, okay, what are the things, what are the problems here? One of the comments also introduced, that they can't be saving. I mean, if you can't store your money, there's no saving. You can't save for the future, if you know, some, some of you, like, you know, just accident the burger, there's no saving, what are you going to do? Then some of the economists replied, maybe savings and all those things uh, should be provided by the, by the communities, or the governments, to so save net. So this is quite a, quite, it's still underdeveloped. But this is quite revolutionary in the sense that it doesn't actually diminish the, uh, the, the incentive for you to, to, to work hard to actually acquire more. Uh, it doesn't actually encourage uh, the risk incentive in a way. So, if you want to work hard, you can work hard. 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 You can that's where it's become a problem. That's where these particular two principles can actually be used to your second tari that only. So by you tak guna, what? So there's kind of a mechanism to defense that. But again, at the same time, it doesn't restrict you to acquire more, uh, to work harder, to get more money, to buy something for you that you want to do and want to use. So because the thing is when we talk, when we think about common economy, the controlled economy and free markets, control economy akan ada jati nak kerja, sebab semua dapat gaji sama, a free market are incentive, but it's not a control. So this kind of a two, I mean, it's still under the right? but these two particular principles are quite interesting. Because um, it's basically based on the same logic. I was familiar, if you cannot accumulate wealth for yourself, if you're not using it in a way, you can't really accumulate it. It's like a lot of money, but you don't to produce more money. Those kind of logic is actually what capitalism is all about, at the center of it. 
And if you look at the dangerous contradictions of Sharon David Harvey, the, this constant desire for growth is what capitalism is all about too. You can't have a, a capitalism without economic growth. Continuous economy. So this things, this too is one of the thesis that economists is trying to develop at the moment. One of the one of the few Marxists that's trying to develop at the moment. That if you have a society where there's a there's a cons, there's a, always a constant production and everything, but at the same time there's always a desire to produce. Wait, this is this this is the this is the best we think about. Some would say, okay, woman, uh, humans desire can never satisfy. But if you talk about the Ferrari, you have to get the right one. Different humans are not the same. But when you draw the other, when you draw the other, at this again one of the uh, uh, critics of Ferrari, as as a Muslims or as a human beings who believe that. I'm the kind of human beings that believe that humans are really not really like that. Uh, we are seduced to do so. Or maybe we have this, we are like capitalism. We have two kind of contradictory desires. There's a desire to just stay put. There's always, again, kalau dalam masa Islam ini, ada nafsu, ada setan, ada nafsu banyak, nafsu jahat tu lah, you know it. We are somehow, uh, there's a two forces at work. But we have this agency to decide. It's not just human desire always wants something bad. There's always a contradictory uh, desires that's once good and bad. There's always an agency to decide depending on who you are. So these are the kind of solutions to it, if you like. Kind of, it's kind of a teaser. What is it like? Imagine a system where um, this MCM, this uh, exploitation of workers, can be uh, is, is gone. <coughs> Auction has money. Anybody's buying the idea? <laughs> There's a few problems that are saving or whether okay, you can do uh, safety net. So when you use as a businessman, you still have incentive to... to people say, okay, um, the reason why businesses are successful is because you have an incentive not to fail. Because if you don't fail, if you don't fail, you don't fail, you don't fail, you don't fail, you don't fail. I think it's, it's, uh, it's a ridiculous idea. You can still have incentive to improve your life, yes. But if the safety net are there, it's not going to be so incentive. The reason why some economists actually again incentive uh, safety net is because they think that's going to come to be counterproductive with the incentive itself. This is basically the safety net. When you when you have extraditized money, you need to have a proper safety net to make sure that those you're saving uh, must be catered by the communities, like either government. I don't like to use the word government because government means you endorse a certain level of nation states, but in a very general sense, communities as a whole. And this can only apply when communities impose it. It works on two principles there, appropriation of uh, properties, and also oxidized money. I think the purpose of this is to destroy rent seekers. Rent seekers. Because, you know, our, he's not against savings, but he's against the idea that this money is going to just make more money. Yeah, exactly. And the bourgeoisie will just sit, you know, and just wait for the money to grow. So once you establish the, the relation, uh, the, the, the material relations, I mean, the companies and everything, mm -hmm. you just sit back, the money is going to grow itself. Something along those lines. Like, yeah. that was, that's the thing that was trying to gain. Marx and Harvey and some of the leftist uh, economists. You know, who, who mentioned this? It's not, Marx has never mentioned this, people guess that, I believe. This is from Keynes. Oh. Surprising. Keynes mentioned, he said, there's a very peculiar economy that are underrated, but uh, it's not as fully explored by uh, the idea. In one of his essays, it's in the book as well, The Seventy Contradiction of Capital. So it's not about much that we know this guy, but that uh, the Keynes that we've learned, is kind of like notice about this guy and said, you know, this could be, could be quite true, but yet under, underrated, underdeveloped. Mm -hmm. And it requires a political will. We to be able to do it uh, in this, uh, that's why if you read the uh, uh, Capital by Thomas Piketty, Capital by Thomas Piketty, anyone is uh, familiar with the arguments of, it's I think, if I'm not mistaken, that the whole uh, project of the book is, the whole arguments of the book is this, that um, capital tend to produce more and more inequality because the R is always tend to, the growth of the return of capital is always higher to the growth of income, uh, in a way. 
So there's more investment than income, uh, than increase, increase in income. When you have more investment, obviously you have more profits, but less growth in income. Then there's more widening inequalities, lah. In a way, that's what the whole argument is all about. And what he suggested is that we have a global taxation. This is a very, again, a very idealistic, but at the same time, uh, realistic. Oh, this is very idealistic for you. Uh, it's idealistic, in fact, it's realistic in the sense that they use global, the language of tax, global taxation, and you have the United, United Nations have had more power to impose this, blah, blah, blah. But it's idealistic to suggest that the governments would like to do it. So it's uh, it sounds realistic. It's being framed in a very realistic manner. Languages like it's a taxation system. We just introduce tax here. It's just a global tax. But it's idealistic because it's somehow tapping uh, the complexities of the uh, of the of the political uh, political companies and the political powers and the companies involved in the, the whole economic international economic transactions. And one of the uh, Marxist critics said that if that happened, we, we already won. This is what Marxist said. That if that happened, if everyone's are being taxed, the whole world, uh, I mean, the whole companies are somehow being monitored uh, through a certain power, we won already. There's a regulation or something of that sort. So that's uh, basically the ideas. I haven't covered the last three slides. So it's, these are only like five slides already. But okay, any questions so far? Then we can watch the documentary MCM. It's a uh, properties industry. It's a basic value documentary. So I'm glad there's no uh, international students. So we can give value here. <laughs> okay, uh, any questions? No? I'm just thinking that we as the know that somehow motivate people to trigger the kind of authority. 